Welcome to this new course module. This module was developed by Sylvain Dessy, a full professor in the Department of Economics at l'Université de Laval, and is based on his experience as a researcher in the field of development. For this module, we will start by sharing the primary motivation for doing research and development. Then we will draw from well-established researchers' experiences to discuss the steps one uses to get started on a research project. We will end with a description of the research process, for example, how one moves from having a research idea to exploring its scientific relevance. Let's start by looking at the primary motivation, in other words, why we do research. The primary purpose of doing research in the field of development is to address a policy question. We are sure you will agree that many interesting policy questions are out there still begging for satisfactory answers, such as how do we end poverty? How can we achieve gender equality? How can we best take care of the environment while promoting economic prosperity? Asking such questions and exploring their answers is doing research. Keep in mind that, in applied economics, doing research is about addressing a relevant policy question. Because public policy is about solving a problem, scholars interested in policy questions usually address them by explaining the causes of the underlying issues. For example, gender inequality, child marriage, uncontrolled emissions of carbon dioxide, chronic budget deficits, etc. Once research uncovers these causes, Remedies are then proposed as policy recommendations. Let's start at the beginning and look at how to start a research project. This is a common question shared by many researchers and students. To answer this question, it may be useful to subscribe to business magazines, such as The Economist, which can provide insight into a wide range of socioeconomic issues and thus generate new research questions, say on the topic of child labor. We will see that there are researchers whose experience can be inspiring. Nathan Nunn is a former co-editor of the Journal of Development Economics and a professor at Harvard University. Part of his research work and development focuses on the exploration of context-dependent public policy. He got started in that research agenda by taking stock of the failure of development intervention prescribed based on the one-size-fits-all research method. He built his research program from the following observations. Current development intervention practices are informed by research based on rigorous methods, but policies derived from these methods lead to ill-fitted one-size-fits-all policies. Examples include the replication in developing countries of policies successfully implemented in developed countries that are not tailored to the individual needs of the developing countries. Improving development intervention may require a deeper understanding of the local context, and exploring context dependency of development intervention can trigger a new research project. Professor Oriana Bandiera is a professor of economics at the London School of Economics specializing in development economics. For Ariana, an excellent way to get started in a research project is to think about the research question one wants to address. Therefore, looking for a research topic depends on whether you wish to address a classic research question, one that has already been addressed, or a novel research question based on an existing puzzle. David M. Blau is a professor at Ohio State University, specializing in the economics of labor and population. Given that many data sources are now freely accessible, for example, demographic and health surveys, Professor Blau believes that those interested in addressing a research question using empirical methods, data mining, or probing the data, might be an excellent way to start. Another way is to read published papers or working papers to see if there is something left out. He emphasizes the need to 1. Expand the search for research ideas by taking a look at studies carried out in other social science disciplines such as sociology, demography, anthropology, and others. 2. 
looking at the data for potential relationships. Christopher Tabor is the editor of Quantitative Economics and is a professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, USA. Professor Tabor thinks that getting started in a research project is about having a research question and having an insight on how to answer it. Therefore, reading the relevant literature is part of getting started on a new project. For him, there are many ways in which one can come across a good research project. There are many ways in which one can come across a good research topic. It could be something fortuitous, or reading a paper or attending a seminar, or starting with a general idea and then reading the literature to see what has been done on the subject. And a question might arise while working on a previous paper. Steve Pishk is a professor of economics and head of the economics department at the London School of Economics. He believes that networking, including talking to colleagues, refereeing papers for journals, and participating in seminars and conferences, all help one get started on a new project. Here's what he believes to be a checklist for someone who wants to get started on a new project. Go to seminars, read survey articles in your research field, read old journals, read bad journals because you might find something to improve on, read journals in other social sciences, read newspapers and specialized magazines, talk to each other, and talk to non-economists about issues that interest you as an economist. And finally, find data sets and read code books. Let's now look at the steps of the research cycle. The research process involves several necessary steps. However, note that how many steps are involved in the production of research depends on the category in which your research falls. In applied economics, there are two main categories. One, applied theory. When you want to illuminate the economics of a given issue, for example, the economics of child labor, and empirical research, when you want to test a model or estimate a parameter. Here I present eight important steps of a research process in applied economics. This is the first and most challenging step. Suppose you followed some of the guidelines for finding a research topic as indicated above, and you believe you identified an idea. It can be something like the prevalence of malnutrition among children, low labor productivity in agriculture, corruption in procurements, girls being married off before the legal age of 18, or women's clustering in low-paid informal jobs. How do you know any of these is a good research topic? The question is relevant because one can easily get overly optimistic or pessimistic about an idea. Once you identify an idea, for example the prevalence of malnutrition, you want to make sure that such a problem is worth studying. Ask yourself, do I really want to spend the next year or more of my professional life wondering on this topic? Given that the topic should be interesting to others in your profession and not just you, the rule of thumb is to talk to other people. This can help you answer the above question. Additionally, it can help you recruit co-authors. One way to know that your topic is good is if others want to join in to study it. As applied economists, you are looking for something that has social relevance, an idea that can inform public policy, policies to reduce youth employment, promote social inclusion, or enhance environmental sustainability, to name a few examples. An idea is interesting if 1. It has social relevance. It affects a critical mass of agents, such as firms, households, communities, etc. And 2. It doesn't leave the underlying problem unresolved, which can severely impact aggregate outcomes, like social cohesion, unemployment, inflation, welfare, development, etc. However, finding such a research idea might be easier said than done. You might want to start with a simple data analysis, 
such as investigating correlations between variables of interest. Be prepared to throw the idea away if you do not get any meaningful empirical pattern. You may also start by writing the simplest possible model of the hypothesized cause of the problem. If you do not get any interesting theoretical insight, perhaps it is time to move to something else. How can one tell if a research topic is good or bad? Here are two examples of good research topics. Child mortality is very high in the Sahel region of sub-Saharan Africa, and the incidence of child labor in Zamunda is the highest in the world. A good research topic should be a socially relevant problem for which the causes are either unknown or not well understood. At this point, we would like to pause for a while to complete exercise 8.1. This is an excerpt from an article written by Taryn Dinkelman and published in the Economic Journal. Can you state the topic of Dinkelman's research? By that, I mean the problem motivating her research. Use the definition given in slide 18 above. Highlight in yellow the sentence in which the research topic is introduced. This is an extract from an article written by Selma Walther and published in Journal of Development Economics. Can you state the topic of Walther's research? Use the definition given in slide 18 above. Highlight in yellow the sentence in which the research topic is introduced. The second step is the review of literature. Reviewing the literature is an important step in the decision to pursue a research idea. It helps you decide whether the idea is worth pursuing or not. This is important because you do not want to spend weeks or months in toiling without making any progress and only to end in a dead end. By reviewing the relevant literature, you will know how to define your research question and identify your contribution to existing knowledge. In combing the literature, you want to 1. Find out what has already been written on the subject. two. Find out what the main differences and similarities are to what other papers or strands have done. And three, understand how your research will contribute to existing knowledge. Step three, now it's time to formulate a research question. Your research question is what draws people to your research. Therefore, formulating a good one is a crucial step in the research process. Here are a few things to keep in mind. People do not care about your research unless your research question changes their mind. And people will not be interested in your research question unless they have a vested interest in its answer. Therefore, ask research questions whose answers are of interest to your audience. A good research question convinces both economists and non-economists that your research is of great public interest. It makes readers interested in the answer your research will provide. A good research question has to relate an effect to a potential cause. The second thing is that the impact of finding a cause must be important. In other words, not finding its cause would leave a critical mass of people worse off. For example, increasing youth unemployment or reducing fiscal revenue. As well, the answer to your research question must be unknown, it must be a puzzle, or existing answers must be deemed unsatisfactory. In the latter case, it will be important to convince the readers that there are reasons to believe that current answers are incomplete or ungeneralizable, hence unsatisfactory. To frame your research question, start by knowing which category it will belong to. Oriana Bandiera, mentioned in slide 9, pins research questions to three main types. First, some come from new puzzles, for example, COVID-19's impact on gender inequality. Second, some may revisit current research projects using better data, for example, accounting for dynamics by replacing cross-sectional data with longitudinal data. And thirdly, some research also revisits current ones but uses better methods. For example, analyzing the causal effect of motherhood on women's self-employment by accounting for both the non-random selection into employment 
and androgeneity of fertility decisions made jointly. Your research question must be clearly stated. To achieve this goal, make sure you avoid using ambiguous words. By that, I mean words that can mean different things. Here is an example of an ambiguous research question. Do climactic shocks impact rural-urban migrations? Here we have two problems. First, the term impact is vague. What impact do you have in mind? Are you thinking of a negative or positive effect? Second, not all climactic shocks have similar effects. A research project usually is one idea. You do not want to bundle ideas into one research question. This is confusing to readers. A research question is not a buffet. Here is a series of examples to help you distinguish between good and bad research questions. Take the first question, does poverty drive child labor? It links a cause, poverty, to a socioeconomic problem, child labor. It is a fairly general question because even trees, which today do not report child labor as a mass phenomenon, experience this issue in the early stages of development. This includes 18th century Great Britain and 19th century U.S. Therefore, the answer to this question may be of interest to economic scholars at large, not only those interested in developing countries where this problem, though in decline, is still prevalent. This is a useful research question. The second question is too narrow in scope. Does the exchange rate make Zamunda's exports more attractive? It might be of interest to the government of Zamunda, but its answer is not, is not generally interesting because it is common knowledge that a higher exchange rate discourages exports. This implies that there is likely to be a very small audience for the research designed to answer this question. Thus, it may not be a good question to use. As for the third question, do land rights increase household efficiency? It also relates a cause, land rights, to an effect, household efficiency. Like the first question, it is also relatively broad in scope, implying that its answer might interest a larger audience, and therefore it is a good research question. Finally, the fourth question, how do farmers' field schools impact cocoa production in the Cameroon? It relates a cause to an effect, but remains vague about the nature of the impact. Are we talking about a positive or a negative impact? It also implicitly narrows the focus to a specific audience, scholars with a vested interest in the Cameroonian cocoa sector. This question is not a good research question. The research question should be as precise as possible, but its scope needs to be broad enough, even though its answer may be context dependent. Note that many good journals state precisely that they do not consider case studies for publication. For example, Journal of Developmental Economics. But they publish papers that use data from specific countries or groups of countries to address broad-based questions. This series of exercises is designed to help you establish a good research question. Read the following excerpt from Dinkelman's 2017 paper published in the Economic Journal and see whether you can formulate the research question her study addresses in that paper. Keep in mind that a research question essentially establishes a cause and effect relationship. Therefore, look for a cause and an effect and see if you can relate one to the other in a sentence. Please use a maximum of 13 words. Read the following excerpt from Rachel Heath's 2017 paper published in the Journal of Development Economics and see whether you can formulate the research question her study addresses in that paper. Please use a maximum of 13 words. The fourth step is to identify the contributions of your study. A research paper's primary objective is to contribute to existing knowledge and change the way people view certain phenomena. Here's one example. Gender inequality. Is it something a policy can change? What is it that we still do not know about this phenomenon? The answer to this question is likely to be a good contribution. Let us try another example. Marriage and women's labor force participation. 
What is it about marriage that links it to low female participation in the labor force? Can a mother really afford not to take a job if she wants her children to be well educated? What is it that we still do not know about this negative relationship? In this example, an excellent contribution to existing knowledge would help to answer the latter question. In the examples we have given so far, the topic has more of a microeconomic focus and emphasizes empirical research. However, this does not mean that good contributions are possible only in micro-level studies and only if they have an empirical underpinning. It is only a reflection of my own preferences. For example, in computable general equilibrium modeling, a good contribution can be thematic, for example, the effect of COVID-19 on public debt. It can also be methodologically driven, for example, a new simulation technique using machine learning. Another important challenge in the field of development is the paucity of valid instruments to overcome endogeneity problems. In this context, a good contribution may be the discovery of a valid instrument, for instance, a quasi-natural experiment such as a policy reform, or the use of a new estimation method for overcoming this endogeneity issue. We said above that the primary goal of doing research is to add to existing knowledge. In applied economics, most research papers state their contributions. In this exercise, you should read the text shown on this slide carefully. It is an excerpt from Dinkelmann's 2017 paper published in the Economic Journal. See if you can identify her contributions to the literature. The fifth step is to select the data. This step is optional for applied theory research. In a study using CGE modeling, this step can be replaced by the description of the social accounting matrix. I will discuss this step with reference to micro-level empirical research. In answering a research question using an empirical method, data selection is an important issue to address. Here's how Josh Angrist, a professor at MIT, puts it. Using a new data set should be preferred to rerun an old data set. This view, however, tends to put a premium on data collection, something that may not be affordable to some researchers. For scholars interested in micro-level empirical analysis, several data sources are freely accessible, such as the Demographic Health Surveys, DHS. But with these freely available data, the odds that someone else beats you to the punch rises substantially. Another way to look for relevant data is networking to explore collaborations with fellow researchers in possession of the data that you need. Once you obtain a data set, one way to find out if the data it contains is relevant to your study is to produce descriptive statistics. Here's what David Blau, professor at Ohio State University, thinks about this exercise. Descriptive statistics provide an interesting set of facts to be explained and provides incentives for researchers to generate new ideas, methods, and approaches to explain the facts. Here's what Chris Tabor, editor of Quantitative Economics, thinks about the production of descriptive statistics for him, this exercise aims to get the researcher to understand what is happening in the data, what story they are telling you. If you find the numbers interesting, you'll be motivated to investigate the potential relationships more formally. One way to find out if your data is interesting is to run a visual examination of potential relationships' existence. Here are a couple of examples. Here, the issue at stake is whether kinship traditions, for example, matrilocality versus patrilocality, influence gender inequality in education. The data comes from the 2016 DHS for Malawi. Married couples' postmarital living arrangements in Malawi are governed by two important kinship traditions. Matrilocality, married couples live with or near the wife's family after marriage, and patrilocality, married couples live with or near the husband's family after marriage. 
Of course, the importance of these traditions has eroded with time, but they remain a salient feature of family life in Malawi. This graph is drawn from a piece of research I am involved in with other people. The left panel represents the gender gap in school dropout rates in a subsample of matrilocal households. In contrast, the right panel represents this gender gap in a subsample of patrilocal households. The graph suggests that poverty, the x axis, is associated with gender inequality in school dropout rates, the y axis, only in patrilocal cultures. The poorer the household, the higher the gender gap in school dropout rates. This relationship does not seem to hold in matrilocal cultures. The second visual test is centered around the hypothesis that early childbearing increases the within-couple gender gap in income. To test this hypothesis, my co-authors and I plot the proportion of households on the y-axis by the wife's share of household income, x-axis. Distinguishing between families where the wife had children during her teenage years from those where she did not. The vertical line in each panel denotes a share of 50% on the x-axis, which is gender equality. The graph suggests that the distribution of the wife's income share is flatter to the right of the 50% line for early childbearers, left panel, than for non-early childbearers, right panel. This positive visual test motivated our decision to investigate the suggested causal effect of early childbearing formally. Like the data step, this step is most appropriate for empirical research. In applied theory, this step is replaced by a theoretical model, for instance micro versus macro. In CGE modeling, this step is replaced by the simulation strategy, for instance dynamic versus static. CGE models. The research question should govern the choice of the model in all of these cases. In the three slides to follow, slides 48 to 50, we summarize insights from three different university professors on the suitable choice of an empirical strategy. The last two steps are to test your ideas and refine your analysis. Once you have executed your empirical strategy and obtained estimation results, the next step is to submit findings from these results to a validity test. There are several ways this can be done, and they are not mutually exclusive. You may include your findings in a grant application as a research project, present them at brown bag seminars in your institution, join or create a reading group with other individuals in your research field, and submit your research project at various conferences. After that, you gather the feedback and use that to refine your analysis.